morning. Praise God. Amen. Amen. You know, I'm, I'm thankful for social media and auto rights because you get to keep up on things and otherwise you wouldn't know. <clears throat> well, you'd know, but maybe not in <clears throat> such real time. And so I just want to say congratulations to Brother Dennis and Sister Sandy. Now, they don't look like this, but they're great grandparents again, right? Amen. So saw Aaron and Patel had an addition to their home. And then did I get it right, Sister Marie? Did you celebrate it? Is it a year or two years? A year today. A year today. What a bliss, right? Yes. The answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. So congratulations on that milestone. Amen. We appreciate that. I don't always see and know, so it's not it's not that I I, I overlook folks. Amen. But when it comes to my mind and I see it, amen, I got it. I, I only got about a month and I got to get ready for my wife to celebrate that she put up with me for an entire decade. Can you believe that? Amen. So, uh, yes, so uh, we, we appreciate those milestones and what God is doing in the lives of people. Amen. Wonderful, wonderful. Turn with me to the book of Romans, chapter number one. Romans, chapter number one. <clears throat> Now, I want you to get in and enjoy the message, amen, every message. I want to share something that will be a blessing to you. I'm not just here fulfilling time, amen. We can do that doing a lot of things, but we just really want God to be honored and glorified in what happens in our church. And I, I just need to tell you one other thing as I get, as you're turning your pages. So we woke up this morning and I woke up uh, sharing my bed with uh, two little ones, amen, and so they were they were just sharing some conversation with us, and so I said, I said to them, I said, I got to get up, I said to Bella, I got to get up, I said, because I got to go get ready and, and finish getting ready for church, and she said, Daddy, are we going to our church today, and I said, yes, we are, she said, good, because our church is the best, <laughs> Amen. So we're glad that we are here at the best church. Amen. And so we just want to see what God will do. Now let me give you a little precursor to my message this morning. I felt challenged to give this message already last week. I hope that I gave you a good encouraging message last week. I felt like the Lord helped. Amen. But I felt that I needed to give this challenging message. And, and when I say challenging... We should feel challenged in, in, in things in our life. <clears throat> I said to you before, a few weeks ago, that uh, it's good for us to have an adrenaline rush every now and then. We can't live with an adrenaline rush, but it's good for us to feel challenged, challenged by things in life. I, I'm challenged by various things, and it's good. It's good for my growth. It's good for my body. It's good, good all the way around. And when we look at our walk with Christ, we should feel some challenges to it. Not that we've came and we've achieved and we've gained and we've reached it, but there should be challenges in our growth to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what, what's, that's what Paul said. And so we, we get to the place where, where we, we no longer are on the milk of things, but we're on the meat of things. And I find that we also, our life is about growing and evolving. I'm glad for where I'm at in life. I'm glad for the ages. We were talking about ages a little bit. Terry and Brother Layman. Amen. There's some things that, that uh, while you're down, you look and see if there's anything else to get done while you're down there, right? Because getting up and down isn't as easy as it used to be. Amen. That's some of the things about life. But one of the things about life is, is that we, we have learned and we've mastered and we've conquered and uh, because we were able to experience various things. And so in our Christian walk, the great thing about Jesus Christ is, is to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so this morning, I want to throw out a message that will be a message of challenge to us in the world in which we live and in our walk with Jesus Christ. We're going to be able, both be looking at Scripture, but we're also going to take some time to look at uh, some references of folks 
who uh, 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 we consider them to be part of church history, they gave us information that was happening in the Roman Empire as the church was growing and as the Roman Empire was wicked, it may even feel like it, it, it does today in our society on a lot of levels. I hope that I can bring some uh, 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 acute awareness to you of what was happening in the Roman Empire and what it was like to live there and the challenges of the Christian church, amen, as they were living a sanctified life as Christ has called us to because he's coming back again. And so with all that said, this is what I want to say. I'm not here to make anybody feel uncomfortable. I'm a sinner saved by grace. I have my challenges in life too. You do as well. I am still striving for the mastery as the Word of God has challenged me. Nothing I say here this morning do I want in any wise to, to, to make someone feel bad because we are all in our Christian walk. We have all are at different places and different levels. I'm saying things on the flip side of the coin because I want to challenge us and encourage us. So I'm saying that right away. Amen. Because some of us, amen, if everybody knew our, our, our past or our struggles, we would probably be pretty ashamed. Amen. But by the grace of God, we're not defined by our past, but we're defined by the blood of Jesus Christ and the walk that we have with Him. Amen. Amen. Every one of us here today. And so I'm, by the word of God, taking the responsibility as a pastor to challenge us to grow deeper. So Romans chapter number 1, verse number 1, the Bible says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel of God, which he has promised before by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, Concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David, sec uh, 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 according to the flesh. I'm sorry, my eyes are getting older. Amen. And declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness. Amen. According to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we, uh, we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name among, uh, among whom are ye also called of Jesus Christ to all that be in Rome beloved of God called to be saints grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ amen let's uh, uh, let's stop right there Amen. Here Paul really gives us a mouthful. Around 126 words I just read to you. 13 commas, 4 colons, 2 parentheses, and 1 semicolon. And let me say, it is another typical sentence that is given by the Apostle Paul. I personally don't write that way. I'm a pretty simple thought fellow. Give a thought, period. A long period. I, I have every paper that I write. I have my English specialist, uh, Sister Holly, read over it and fix all the punctuations. <laughs> Amen. So, Paul, I'm not really quite the same as you. In fact, I understand why Simon Peter said sometimes it was hard to understand. Amen. Uh, what, what Paul was writing his letters. Amen. But, but, but here it is. Amen. Almost right in, in the middle of, of this. Amen. We, we find that uh, he, 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 he says something interesting. Not in the middle, but almost at the hundredth word. He said to all that be in Rome. And he said, call to be saints. And that's what we're going to look at. What does it mean to all that be in Rome, call to be saints? And I think that even to understand this even better, we have to look at those individuals who were at Rome. Amen. These uh, 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 people that, that, that are part of uh, church history, uh, I'll tell you some things about them. We're going to reference them. We're going to look at Scripture. However, we're also going to reference it with church history so that we can better understand what was happening here in Rome. You know what? 
What we know was being preached was there was a call to a sanctified. To a sanctified. Or a holy life to those who were at Rome. The message is that Jesus is coming. That we have to live holy. Folks, it's easy to get caught up in this world and in culture. So we have to look at the Word of God. We have to hear the preaching of the Word of God. So it helps us to live the sanctified life that God has called us to so that we can be ready when He first comes. Can I tell you that when we look at the Word of God, we think about Christmas. We think about Jesus coming. And there were 300 references in the Word of God to Jesus coming. But can I tell you that for every reference to Him coming first time as a baby, there are eight references to Him coming again the second time. So if we know that He came the first time, rest assured that He's coming back the second time. And He said that things are going to be bad when He comes back. Amen. Look at the signs of the time all around us. Amen. He is coming back. Amen. So early on in Acts chapter number 1, the Bible says, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into the heavens? This same Jesus which is taken up from you shall come in like manner as you have seen Him go. But there is some first-hand information that we know, amen, about His return. He's going to be coming back, amen, and the whole world will be uh, aware of His coming back. You look at Scripture, the Bible says that there will be two working in the field. Presumably, maybe in the morning, amen, sometimes during the day. We know that He is coming back. Those two will go and see. For one will be taken away and the other will be left. We know this, that two will be in the bed. One will be taken and the other left. So round about the globe, while one half of the world is wide awake and working hard, and the other half is sleeping, Jesus is coming back, but the whole world is going to know about it. Amen. Amen. We forget Jesus is coming back. We shouldn't be looking for a hole in the ground as much as we're looking for a hole in the sky that Jesus is coming back for the saints. Amen. His coming will be a, 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 to a normal world. The Word of God says in Luke 17, 27, Amen, they'll be eating, they'll be drinking, they'll be giving in marriage, they'll be building, they'll be occupied. It's just another day, but Jesus comes. The third thing that we know about it is that he is coming back to an evil world. He compared it to the time of Lot, to the time of Noah, to quickly give you a, 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 an eye of what that means. Amen. God looks down and he's disappointed that he even created man. And he looks and Noah finds grace in the sight of God. One man in the whole world. Amen. You look at, 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 at Lot and, and we find the most disgusting, evil living that could ever be. Amen. Where Lot was. Doesn't it almost describe the world today? So Jesus is coming. But I need to tell you that He's coming back to a world that is ready. I was going to say some things about prophecy, but I feel like I don't really have the time to get into that. But what I do want to say is that when, when He comes back, amen, He's coming back for the saints. It's not... Not everybody who just believes in God. Not people who do good works. But those who are bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. And they continue to live a sanctified life. Amen. And so the Bible says that there in Rome they were called to be saints. They were preserved in the middle of, a, of an evil society. Amen. Where there is promiscuousness going on, where there is, is wickedness going on. So they weren't facing anything that, that we don't face today. And so the first thing I want to look at is this. I said to you in my message of the vision of what I've had for this church is a place where there can be strong families that grow. Families look different. I'm just going to say this at the beginning. Sometimes 
There are traditional families of a mom and a dad. Sometimes there is just one parent, whether it's because death has happened or whether it's because a divorce has happened, something has happened, amen, but there's still a family. Amen, sometimes there are grandparents raising grandchildren, but it's still a family. Amen, sometimes there are blended families, but it's still a family. Amen, so there's a lot that I could say, and if you have questions on this, please come to me and ask me. But I just want to say that, uh, that we look at Rome and at Rome at this time, there was an increasing amount of divorce that was going on. In fact, it was very, very much the core of the Roman civilization that there would be divorce going on. Let me say this. There may be some in here, you've gone through a divorce. There is healing for you and there is hope for you. There is restoration for you. There is certainly a great big place in the kingdom of God for you. Amen. That doesn't count you down and out. Amen. Uh, all of us have been a victim of sin somewhere in our lives. Amen. And I don't believe that it's there to mar you and mark you so that you live and fumble throughout life. I believe that there is restoration. I believe that there is healing. I believe that there is wholeness. Amen. Because that's the God that we serve. But what I'm preaching about is to those that are holy together in the, in the kingdom of God. Amen. In the church world, divorce can be even more so than what there is in the world. Amen. God wants the sanctity of marriage to be whole in the church. Amen. He wants whole families. He wants moms and dads who love Him more than anything. And then they love each other. And they love their children. And they know that God has designed this family. And God is strengthening this family. Amen. God is able to keep us holy in a very unholy environment. Good. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. But in this environment that there was in, that there was in Rome, amen, uh, uh, in church apology, uh, you, uh, you can read in chapter number 8, the Bible says divorce was so commonplace that Tertullian once uh, remarked, as for divorce, women long for it as though it were the natural consequences of marriage. Amen. God doesn't want that. God has designed whatsoever He's joined together. Let no man put asunder. God loves the family. God gives hope for the family. God gives love and restoration in the middle of difficulty. Amen. We should never enter into marriage so lightly that we think that if it doesn't work out, well, then we'll just go our opposite ways. Amen. But I encourage folks, amen, when they get married in a marriage counseling, amen, the two become one. Amen. It is a cleaving together. It is a weaving together. Amen. And as God begins to write your love, story. Amen. God has great things for the man and the woman that honor Him and love their spouse. Amen. The church, amen, we've got to understand that we live in a culture that accepts divorce and promotes divorce and takes the things of marriage and family lightly. But God does not. God does not. Amen. And so the Bible says in, in Luke chapter 16, verse number 18, Whosoever put it away his wife and marrieth another, that one committeth adultery here in this day and age in, in, in Rome. Well, they, they thought that adultery was, was fun. What do we, and I don't want to get ahead of myself, but, but what, what does the world entertain themselves with? Soap operas where there's, there's infidelity where there's adultery, where there's fornication, where there's all kinds of sexual sins. Amen. But God honors marriage. And God honors the relationship of one man and one woman in marriage. And so I want to tell you that the holiest thing that we can do with our lives, amen, is say that, that I'm honoring. I'm honoring God with marriage. I'm honoring my spouse in marriage. I'm loving and I'm giving because God honors this. I want to tell you that God is more than the God of the church. But God's a God that comes into our homes and helps us 
gives us joy in our relationships. Amen. Gives us love when things go wrong. Folks, we are going to face difficulty. Amen. Families. Amen. Things happen. But how do we how do we come out on the on the upside of things with, 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 with positive results? Because we honor God in the middle of all this. Amen. See. Sometimes folks can just think that any relationship, any relationship can have its norms because it's culturally accepted. Amen. But what's culturally accepted doesn't mean that it's always pleasing to God. So I want to say to us this morning, how can we better invite God into our homes? Our homes are all different here. All of us have different functionalities of how we live and what is our families and our status and our place in life. But how do we best honor God with all of our relationships? And when we question that and we seek God for that, we say, God, I'm keeping my life holy until you come again. And you know what? For every one of us in here, God can help us live holy lives that are honorable to Him. And so for Miracle Revival Church, I say let's live holy in our church. Let's live holy in our homes. Let's live holy in our relationships. Amen. So that we can show the world that even when it's against the cultural norms, amen, that we're still saints of God. Amen. And we still want to honor God with everything in our life. Amen. Isn't it awesome? Amen. To honor God with our lives. One of the things that we're facing more than ever before is rampant abortion. You know, when we look at church history, they face the same thing as we do. You may say, brother, no, abortion. Yeah. They devalue lies, life. I worked with a woman. It was absolutely amazing. She worked as a missionary. And on mission fields where they don't have doctors who perform abortions, when their babies are born and they don't want them, or their babies are born and there's something wrong with them, they just take them out to the woods and abandon them. So part of her job was she searched the woods for babies that were abandoned. And she grabbed them and brought them into orphanage, orphanage and, 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 and saw them uh, and nurtured and cared for. Let me stop right here. I don't know all your story, and I don't know where you may have been or where you are at or what life may have brought to you. And maybe you're here, maybe you've experienced abortion. I want you to know that there's healing for you, and there's hope for you, and there's peace for you. You don't have to live under condemnation. You don't have to live under that guilt. Amen. There is forgiveness there. Amen. God offers forgiveness to all. Amen. And so as bad as you may feel, amen, that may be something in your life that God can take and bring healing and restoration with and use it in a greater way than you can ever imagine. And I believe that on the other side of eternity, amen, there's going to be a greater healing as that child is in the presence of God. Amen. I truly believe that. Amen. But I want to say this, that as we live in a culture, amen, that devaluizes, amen, unborn children, do you realize that there are 40 to 50 million babies that are aborted around the globe per year. Amen. There is 125,000 babies that are aborted per day around the globe. It is estimated that there are 5,000 pregnancies that are abor uh, uh, terminated every day in America. Amen. It is beyond our wildest imagination how, how, how great the number of abortion is. And I do believe this. I appreciate what is happening in, in our government right now that is standing up for life. Amen. We have to admit that that is something that we have heard and, and the evangelist, uh, evangelical, evangelical community is seeing a greater trend. Amen. For good things happening. But this is what Octavius writes. One of our church historians. He says, There are some women among you who by drinking special potions extinguish the life of the future human in their very battles, thus committing murder, 
before they even give birth. We are living in a world that is wicked. But God is not asking more of us in this generation than what He asked even in the early church. They were facing the same things. And the Apostle Paul said, Amen. He calls us to holiness. And he says, There are saints even among you in Rome. This morning I'm talking about standing up for righteousness. I'm talking about standing up for what honors God. I gotta move on quickly. <clears throat> we live in a world. And I want you to think, I'm not putting boundaries on anything this morning. I'm simply placing this to you and asking you to pray as I pray about what's right in my life and to research the Word of God. I cannot give you specifics of things in the small time frame in which we have. But we live in a world full of immodesty. In 1 Peter, chapter number 3, the Word of God says, Likewise, you wives, be in submission to your own husbands. Amen. And that if you obey not the word, they also may be without word by one, by the word, be won by conversation of the wives. On down with Timothy, he talks about uh, being adorned in modest apparel, apparel, shamefulness, sobriety, not with the growing of hair or the gold or the pearls or costly array. I want to stop here for a moment. I want to say something. This culture was also living in that you have to dress in the most expensive and the most elaborate. Sometimes in clothing that look like you weren't even wearing clothing. We live in a culture that is name brand driven. We live in a culture where folks want to spend the most expensive to look good. We live in a culture I did not realize till I had children of my own little girls. We live in a culture that it's hard to find things that are modest. Amen. It's so low cut, even for little children. God help us. Amen. The backs out of things, the shortness of things, the tightness of things that need no imagination to anyone. I'm talking about a culture in which there is immodesty. God has called us to be clothed, amen, with His holiness and His righteousness. When we look in the mirror, amen, is it the fanciest? Amen. Is it that we look the youngest? Is it that we look the most vibrant? Amen. In this culture, <laughs> Let me just read a, 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 a clip from uh, uh, the everyday lives of, of, of these uh, 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 Christian, uh, early Christians. He said, while you remain at home, your hair is at the hairdressers. You take out your teeth at night and you sleep tucked away in a, in a hundred cosmetic boxes. Even your face does not sleep with you. Then you wink at men under an eyebrow you took out of the drawer the same morning. These are things that were being written way back in Room. They were saying there's a problem. Amen. We don't want to live godly. We don't want to look like God and act like God. We're more consumed with looking youthful and looking bright. And, and in our culture, it's always pushing the envelope. I want to be defined by something. How about we as Christians get back to being defined by who Jesus Christ is? I want to break the mold of something. Sometimes folks think that that that, that and, and women you get you you get hammered sometimes pretty hard. That that, that folks think that, that being a Christian is being meek and being quiet. Well, that may be your personality, or it may not be your personality. Amen. You might be the person who's able to speak up because you are someone and your personality who is driven. That is not what I see the word of God speaking. It's putting on the holiness of God. Amen. When you get up in the morning, you want to look like Jesus more than you want to look like the things of this world. Called to be saints. What is the thing that drives us? Finding the latest website that shows us the latest trends and fashions and how to look good and how to look young. 
Or do we get up and say, I want to put on Jesus Christ today? The modesty issue that we're training our young children, even at a young age, is how to dress seductive and sensual. That's not how I want my daughters to find a husband. I already tell my daughters, I want you to find someone who loves God more than they love you and loves you much than no one else in the face of the earth. I'm talking about culture. God, help us to be saints in the middle of it all. Amen. God, help us. I chuckled when I read church history about them taking their teeth in and out. There's nothing wrong if you need to have you have to have teeth because yours has not lasted you your lifetime. But they simply did it because they wanted to look good. Their hair was left out at the hairdresser. They didn't like their hair, so they, they changed it. Maybe there's a time and place for wigs. I guess I could choose one, but I haven't got one yet. That must be a little year there. <laughs> but I'm talking about what's it like to honor God even in our very appearance. Let me put on Christ every day. See, we live in a world where it's full of raunchy entertainment. It's no different than the plagues and the things that was going on back in Rome. I'm not even going to read what they said because I don't like to do that mixed company. I heard a preacher say something one time. They bounced back to dress. Told myself a little note here and looked right over. He said, I'd love to know what the fruit was that Adam and Eve ate and they knew they were naked. Because during the summer, I'd like to give that fruit to a lot of people. They entertained themselves, Brother David, gladiators who would fight to the death of their opponent. They would take animals out and they would fight and they would kill them. Animals that were not fed well and they would entertain themselves with these. Lactanius said this, who finds it pleasurable to watch men being killed even though the man has been legally condemned. Pollutes his conscience just as much as he were an accomplice or willing spectator of a murder committed in secret, yet they call these things sports, where human blood is shed when God forbids to kill. He not only pro prohibits the violence that is, that is uh, commended by public laws, but also forbids violence that is deemed lawful by men. See, I want you to think about the things that we watch on TV. How many murders just within a show. But we entertain ourselves with this in society. God says that murder is a sin. I said to you earlier, the things that we watch where, you know, <clears throat> my girls were given a little uh, trinket. And so we thought, came from a Christian organization, Christian place. We thought that, well, that must be okay. My wife said she was watching it. The next thing you know, there are two same-sex parents there. That's what the TV went off. That's not acceptable. That's not the norm. And let me just say this. If we don't start going to our polls and voting for what's right, have you heard what they want to do to the church who preaches against that? They want to take our, our, our tax exemption status away. That's just this week. I'm talking that no matter what happens, we as a church have to be willing to stand for what is right. The Bible says it. That's not what uh, a pastor Seville's personal preference is or what his tangent is. That's what the Bible says. And so we have to be careful. The things that we allow to come into our homes that entertain us, that desensitize us to the things of God. I'm talking to a church as Paul was talking to the church in Rome. He said, we are called to be saints. We are called to live holy. 
And so my call to you is this, that Jesus Christ is coming again. He's coming soon. It may be at night. It may be during the day. But one thing that we know for sure, the promises are given to us, amen, that He's coming. So our life shouldn't be about being, uh, that, that, we're, that we're devaluizing the family or thinking that marriage is not important or family is not important. It should be important because it's important to building the kingdom of God. We need to watch how we dress and what we dress with. Amen. What is the things that we want to robe ourselves with? Most of all, I pray that it's the spirit and likeness of Jesus Christ more than anything else. And His righteousness. And then the things that we allow in our home, that we entertain ourselves with. God help us that we're not entertaining ourselves with things that hung you on the cross. And help our homes to be holy. Because Jesus is coming. Amen. I just want to say this. Sister Holly, if you come to the piano, I'm not done. And I have way more notes. I'm not preaching something we're doing something. What we do will not get us to heaven. But the blood of Jesus gets us to heaven. But because we're bought by the blood of Jesus, we don't just live in an open escape of grace that says, I can do anything I want. We are not our own. Amen. The Word of God says that we've been bought by Christ. So everything about our lives, we want to honor God. Hey, listen, folks. I fall short. This message is for me as well. I fall short. But the message is for us to say, God, the requirements have not changed since the early church. And we don't have it any different in this generation. They face the difficulty of as well. But the requirement to live holy is possible. Because Paul said, to the saints that are, that are at Rome, we can do it because they did it. We can do it because God will not require of us to do something that we cannot achieve. But we do it in and through His Spirit. So we open up the Word of God and we allow the Spirit of God to speak to us. God, how can I best honor you by living a sanctified and holy life? How can I best be like you? And as the Word of God deals with us, the Spirit of God will help us. So this morning, let's be a church that is living as saints in a corrupt generation. Thank God for forgiveness. I would be doomed and destitute. But He has forgiven me. And He gives me grace to live holy. This message isn't for one or two this morning, but it's for all. Can we gather in and just say, God, I want to be the saint in 2019 in the United States of America. Even when culture is so wicked, God, I want to live righteously before you because I want to honor you. Let's go in this morning.
continue to evaluate ourselves. That we are your God. Amen. So many areas. But oh, Jesus. When I get there, I want to be able to throw my crowns at your feet. Knowing that on this side of eternity, my priority was honoring you. And then let's stand this one. I'm glad for you folks to be here. Oh, you listening to good this morning. You prayed. Oh, yeah. You sang good. Amen. Well, I should have known that God was right. She said, we're going to the best church. Amen. I love that. We are blessed. You know, we are the best people. And Brother Craig, we close this prayer. So thankful to be here today, Lord, that we can serve this Lord. We thank you for this message for us, Lord. It's more and more and more. We just ask that you apply to us, Lord. Take our minds and take our minds, Lord. Show others to relate to us, Lord Jesus. Lord, we ask that you bring us back safely again, Lord Jesus. Amen. 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 Amen.